we're at this point where we have more control than we ever have at every tier. So why aren't we doing that in utilizing that? And how do we get it to that next level as musicians without overdoing it or overdoing it? Who cares if that's the moment? Welcome everybody to Nashville Drummers Podcast, episode 33. Today's guest is Rob Bodley, who many of you may know from Nashville rock act, The Foxies. And Rob and I had coffee a few months ago, and we've stayed fairly close. And it was so good to finally have him on and really dive deep into his career and what he's currently up to. Rob is such a genuine professional in every sense of the word. And this was a very wide-ranging interview. We discussed a lot of different topics, including touring, playback, Ableton, and music directing. Rob reminds us to sort of zoom out of our specific role on the drums and to focus on elevating our live show and our live set and kind of thinking bigger picture, whether that be the way you transition between songs, the way you count off those songs, or even you know the sounds that you're getting, which drums are you using? And maybe that's electronics, maybe it's a hybrid. We get into all of that. He shares some really cool stories and perspectives, which I really appreciated. Yeah. Well, and I, I really appreciated. We got to dive into a little bit of the nerdier practice stuff, which is my bread and butter, if I'm being honest. So getting to talk to him about what he calls distracted practice. Yeah, that was a gold mine. That was, man, <laughs> that was some good stuff. We hope you enjoy this episode. And before we get started here, just want to remind everyone that it's getting hot. It's the perfect time to adorn your Nashville Drummers podcast official tank top. Yeah, these are super comfy. We got all sizes available, small, medium, large, and extra large. Just 20 bucks, Venmo or cash, and we'll get those into your hands. And onto your head and scalp, we will also adorn a hat, which will keep your eyes from going blind from the sun, which is deadly. <laughs> the way you said it, sounds like we're like gluing these hats on their heads. Yeah, permanent. <laughs> sounds like a forceful. Keep it. You're not taking that thing off. <laughs> we're going to shave your head bald, cover it in glue, put, put it on there, and then what's on there, we're stapling it. That's, it's not going yeah, anywhere. Brand awareness, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, purchasing merch really does help support what Nate and I are doing on the podcast, and it helps us continue to put out new episodes month after month. And before we get into the episode, want to give a quick shout out for the Music City Drum Show happening July 29th and July 30th right here in Nashville, Tennessee. This year's event will feature hundreds of exhibitors with new products that you can test and try for yourself. Also, this year's clinics will feature Rich Redmond and Ray Luzier, so don't want to miss those. We actually interviewed Landon Hall, the founder of the Drum Show, back in episode 13, so definitely check that out. And he gives us a behind-the-scenes look into how we actually started a drum show from scratch, which is really cool stuff. And again, you can use the promo code NDP, all lowercase, for 10% off tickets, which are available only online at musiccitydrumshow.com. We hope to see you there. And I need to build this track rig for this other artist. I will almost immediately go into doing that during quality time. Like my brain will start looking on websites and like and researching things. And she's like, this is not quality because you are not here. I'm like, right. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, dude, I'm, I've been learning the same thing. As I, I, we went through it um, and actually we talked about this on just the last, um, the last podcast. We did a little like mini, mini podcast about mental health, which, yeah. uh, which was fun. It really um, was fun. It yeah. was, dude, like – who knew that, that a topic that's so heavy would end up being like such a good time and I really, really enjoyed doing it. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I talked about it like I almost got divorced because I didn't have that balance figured out. And mm -hmm. now I'm like, not to say that I have it perfectly figured now, but no, it's a juggle, right? Right. But, but I'm way further along now. I'm, oh yeah. Okay. And for her, it's the same thing. Quality time. Very, very important. My need for that is so minimal. I'm like, if I'm just in your presence and we get, like you said, an hour I'm like, yep, yeah, cool. That feel that fills my tank. I'm like, I know, yeah, I know you love me. I, you know, I love you. I'm, that's what I'm. I'm thinking. <laughs> and then you're like, like well, time to practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm like, I'll be back yeah. in a couple hours. She said, well, I, you know, I need you to do this. And then I'm like, okay, I'm learning that, and it's that feels good too because I can see that filling up her emotional tanks, which 
makes me happier. Seeing that reflected is just so, it's so satisfying. I'm sure you feel the same way. Oh yeah. I mean, when you, it, it shows too, because then the, the things that you need become more easy for your significant other to do, right. you know, like say your quality, like she's quality time. So you give her that quality time and then your words of affirmation, Yeah, the words of affirmation flow more freely when you're satisfying that person's needs. Yep. And it becomes this kind of like, you know, ebbs and flows. It works better that way. And like, once we had that conversation, it, it's been so easy. Again, we've been together 10 years, uh, pretty much at this point, just growing up together. But, um, yeah, yeah I mean, it's about ebbs and flows because tour comes and goes, you know, like right. you may get the, especially if you're subbing or if you, if you got, you need a break or you're, I'm sorry, if you're on a break with one artist and you've got someone else who's just asking you, you're like, Hey, I'm going to go out for like two weeks with this other person, you know, and then you got rehearsals and all this other stuff that you have to be doing when you're in town. Hmm. So it's like, you have to learn to ebb and flow. So when you are there being present is so key, you know, yeah. and I'm not really doing any of the subbing stuff myself right now, but I still have a lot of side work that gets in the way and, and musicians were so, I, I, there's a nuance, especially in drummers, I feel like. And every drummer I meet, it's very different. We're focused in a different way. We're a weird breed. Mm. Yes, we are. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we started this podcast. Yeah, right? right? <laughs> to uncover all the weirdness. Well, and, and <laughs> you know, I think one of the things, one of the hallmarks of being a musician is, I mean, it's cliche at this point, but there's such a struggle to it because it's not a traditional profession. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess well, I'm going to put air quotes on traditional. Uh, and you ha have to sometimes string together so many ideas. Well, maybe this will work. Maybe this gig will pay off. Maybe if I work with these guys, eventually that will turn into something before something actually, actually pops yeah. off. And that doesn't exactly stop. I mean, so for some people it does. You, get, you land like a giant gig and you go, you know what? That's all I need. From this is th it. That's it. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm... Steve Ferroni, I'm going to play for Tom Petty, and that's it. I don't need to do anything else. Or Jake, Jake Summers is playing with Luke Combs. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. I mean, that's the Cinderella story. Though. You, you know, and he has really good advice on how he, you know, his story. Yeah. yeah. But, like, someone could follow that exact advice and still never, never get, get that gig. Right. Yes. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's so it's always, there's never, there isn't a perfect formula to follow. It's just you're going to struggle. That's what is going to happen. The advice I give to every musician and friend that, that either wants to move here or L.A. or New York. Mm. I've definitely been telling people that moved to New York less. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what yes. scenes there? What, what are you trying <laughs> to do? Question mark. Jazz, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so uh, yeah. You're, try, you're trying to do straight head jazz? Well, no. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. Right so, on. So do you already have a huge pop gig? <laughs> yeah, right. No? no? Okay. Why are you moving there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you'd be better off moving to Atlanta. Y yeah. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> the Atlanta scene is dope. Yeah. But get used to playing pop and hip hop, which is, I love playing. But right. yeah. So Rob, you've been in Nashville, what, 10 years almost? Oh, God. Well, leaning on that side of five, but I think between six and seven right now. Yeah. Okay. I can't really remember. The significant other knows probably the exact hour. Yeah, so, I'm sure. Like, and I'm like, about that, you know. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, tell our good listeners, you know, just what you're currently up to. This will probably air mm -hmm. in June yeah. 2023, and then we'll, I'm sure we'll get into your backstory and your journey here and everything. Yeah. Um, I played drums for a group called the Foxies, uh, but I'm also the music director of that band. I work with all of our tech, so I'm hand-in-hand -hand constantly calling our production manager, our audio team. Um, but yeah, my main focus is drums and music directing, building the live show, the ebbs and flows of a live show. Um, that's really my big focus of that group. And then all the crazy social media stuff, all those meetings that you got to do when you're in the band, that mm -hmm. stuff really is mind numbing, but I'm there for those, you know, yeah. sipping my coffee going TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In more ways than one. <laughs> TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> good one. Cringy words, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but I, I do a lot of work with uh, other artists, whether I'm subbing in on drums. I've kind of been stepping out of that role and focusing more on live coaching and music directing. So a lot of the artists I did play for, I now hire a new drummer and I show up and kind of coach the musicians in the band, including, you know, 
everyone everyone in the band, uh, whether it's the guitarist, keyboard player, doesn't matter. Um, but really focusing on building their show. And, and again, that's what I do in the Fox season. It kind of just kind of morphed into that. I didn't really have time to keep playing drums and, and, and letting people down and saying, hey, I'm not in town, I'm not yeah. available, but I still want to be present in developing your artistry. And I love that. I love being a part of the growth of other artists. So um, as much as I wanted to do it, and I did it for about a year where I was trying to drum with anyone and everyone that I had already on the roster, I just realized uh, with the home life balance and everything else, it wasn't possible. Um, yeah. So I pulled myself out and said, I want to be present and help you and grow that but from the capacity of which i can do it so yeah that's so cool we talked to a lot of drummers on here that they have kind of touched or you know gotten their hands dirty with directing or especially with playback but like it seems like you're doing a lot more than just setting up you know tracks and yeah it starts there do you play other do you play other instruments besides drums yeah i i went to school for music so i have a degree in performance and it came hand in hand with percussion so uh mallets but they force you to (laughs) yeah right (laughs) they they force you to play piano and i don't regret a bit of it so yeah and and okay where'd you go to school where are you from let's back it up yeah yeah so i'm from upstate new york uh right outside of syracuse yeah that's right so little little town I would say more country than Nashville, to be honest with you. Hmm. Like, I, I had some friends who were just texting me last, who were there last night, actually. Yeah, it it's a fun town to visit because it's such a different space, but it's so boring. I mean, there's literally nothing to do but go to a Syracuse game and get in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I kind of fell into music, in a in a weird way. There's so many musicians in my hometown. It was it, unreal. We had battle of the bands, and like the amount of musicians that came out of my town. Or crazy. Uh, so my English teacher's son played drums for Travis Tritt for years, big and rich. Wow. Um, so David Northrup, uh, one of the older guys in country music, and he was a big mentor to me. I'd always ask him as many questions as I could. Um, but, yeah, I, I didn't really want to do music. Kind of just fell into it. I was a skateboarder. I wanted to do all of that. I think that's a lot of like early 2000s musicians stories you know like yeah punk kid um yep those early childhood bands and yeah like right the dreams yeah I, I was listening to a bunch of the podcasts and you know one i think it was the first one i mean it's a while a while ago but you grew up in reading right right yep. um and yeah you had bands so we all we all know yeah, yeah i was we, in a travis barker yeah. i mean pop punk pop an a2 <laughs> cover band oh yeah yeah travis barker so were those musical roots started in high school or where, yeah. where did that yeah I, I took music I was in music all throughout school yeah um my music teacher then would tell you I was lazy and <laughs> didn't have a musical bone in my body but on the other hand would tell everyone I was very good and just wanted to pull something out of me <laughs> um so it was really interesting because many years later I found out he had been telling my parents that like he just needs to stop being lazy because I remember I would fall asleep and then like wake up and be like ding 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 yeah <laughs> So you're doing like the concert band and orchestra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, anything I get my hands on. As soon as drum set became a thing in my school, I was like, I want that. Yeah. I, I'm going to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it started really early, though. My dad got me a snare drum. And, you know, my dad was a godsend. He was a hard man. But I think that's why I, I you know, I am where I am. <laughs> um, he got me a snare and he said, if you can't play music on this, I won't buy you a next thing. So he's like, mm. I want you to be able to take the snare and not just play rudiments and not just play snare pieces. He's like, make it musical. And then he bought me brushes. And then he bought, you know, and he's like, make this musical. Yeah. And then once he yeah. saw that and heard it, he, you know, eventually I, I got a drum set. And but That's cool. That's the first time I'm hearing that. Normally it's like, oh, what's your first kit? As kids, we just get a drum set as a whole, yeah. but not like individual pieces. Yeah. I mean, he was pretty strict to his rules wanted it that way but he said if if you want to do something i will invest every bit if you show that progression and desire and hunger for it um i will i will invest all the way to the end and he and he still does like i don't ever ask him for things um but the man will legitimately just like you'll just wake up and and it's not even financially Mm. it's just like other level of investments of like being Mm. at shows my my dad's very sick being at places he shouldn't be and and you're just like there's that level of love. Like I would be playing drums and I'd turn around and he'd be sleeping 
in the chair next to me with earplugs in. Dude, that's amazing. Wow. And I was just like, this man yeah. loves it. Yeah. yeah. So that's I think yeah. that's why when we were talking about like the ultimatums and stuff like that, yeah. when we came to that crossroad in my relationship, I knew that I would never give this up. Many relationships where, where girls are like, I just don't want a musician. I don't want to date that. They loved the idea, but then I've been touring full, almost full time. I started at 19 and I was on my first full tour across the U.S., 19 years old. So yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. But many girlfriends where I was like, this, I'm never choosing you. Like, you, yeah. you got to know this. Yeah. And it was one line my dad specifically said, and he, he said, I've never seen my son happier than when he's on stage. Mm. And it's true. I, when I'm up there, I'm, I'm in the moment. I'm just alive. I feel it. You know, you guys probably feel it too. You're there and you're just like, this is the most home I've ever felt. Yes. And yeah. I'm like, I will never give this up. Unless, like, I lose every limb on my body. Right. Hopefully I never do. God, yeah. God forbid that, <laughs> yeah. that should happen. Yeah, uh, 100%. Even this. if I lose one limb, I'll figure it out. Dude, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. Def Leppard. <laughs> yeah. Let's go, man. <laughs> if that's, like, alive in you, you're going to find a way yeah. to make that a thing. I'm like, if I lose all my limbs, I'll compose. I'll freaking yeah. put my nose on a on a logic <laughs> session and uh-huh. point and click and freaking I'm like yes yeah. I will never stop. Just wheel me in yeah. there and I'll start music directing with with no limbs. <laughs> yep, with the baton in my mouth. I'll start oh my conducting. God. I love it. Dude, so you mentioned your first tour at 19. Tell us about that. Like who was that with and oh, what was man. that like for you? What did you learn from that? <laughs> I learned <laughs> how to crash a trailer. Jeez. Oh. <laughs> they had you driving? Uh uh yeah. 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 Um gosh, it's been so long, but uh by then I had already been in tons of different variations of bands, but I met a really young hungry guy named Joey Arena amazing dude still lives in upstate new york killing the scene in like new metal um but he saw me play with some other band and he asked me to go on tour with them and um i'd known the band because they had like a good and bad rap all around town for like firing musicians <laughs> um mainly because he just he wanted people to take it serious and and i saw that and i was like he's not a bad guy he just wants to live a professional life. Right. And if you don't take it serious, then get out of my band. Yeah. And and I was like, I want that. So I rehearsed for like a week. And then I our first trip, I got in the van with them. And oh, I hadn't slept in like a day. And we drove straight to Marietta, Georgia. So it's a long trip from New York State to Georgia. Yep. Yes, it is. Not sleeping. And then playing a show. And then they're like, Okay, Rob, you got to drive to North Carolina. <laughs> and I was like, I, I've never driven a trailer. Uh, were the other members of the band Dennis Lee. older? And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were, you were um, the young I was a couple years older. Okay. I mean, to, back then, that age gap, you feel like they're so knowledgeable. They've been they've yeah. been doing it forever. And, you know, realistically, they've only been doing it a few more years than I had yeah. at that time. But those guys became my brothers for years. I still talk to Joey, the leader of the band. And, and like I said, he's morphed into new metal now and doing a really good job he's most of his records are produced by jd from ice nine kills oh wow um so like they're doing very well in upstate i think he's trying to move to nashville he was just here and yeah it was a good time i was not the musician i should have been for touring but uh yeah i i remember getting hired because i it won't that 19 was the only kid that could play live to a metronome in that town uh, wow <laughs> um, and they were playing with tracks, yeah. you know, stereo cable out, click right, tracks left. Wow. So, yeah. How did you get good at that? I mean, was it? Did you grow up in church, or were you just musically like? At that point, I had been playing at a church for yeah. a while. Um, but no, I just practice with a metronome, you know, Whoa. like and <laughs> so simple. Yeah. <laughs> you just yeah. practice with a metronome. Yeah, that's literally it. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I played in a band with an older group, a cover band of guys, and they they were much older and. And it was just really local, but they loved playing with the metronome. So, like, if it was, like, a song that was just the same tempo the whole time, they're like, just throw on a click and we'll play to it yeah. in the live set. Like, why not? It's not about pride. It's dropping in town. Like, when you're in the moment, sometimes just having that, even if you just start with it, it's nice to be like, it's at 140, so let's make yeah. it at 140. Because yeah. nerves get in the way of everybody, especially totally. a young drummer. Oh, yeah. So, and you're in new cities, new venues. Yeah. I mean, there's so much newness to that. 
you know? Yeah, and, and it's like starting a song is the most important. So I say it's yeah. like even if you're in a band that doesn't want to use tracks or me- whatever metronome, it's nice to even just see it blink and you're like, cool. Until you learn to internalize. Like now, you know, I could sing a song or feel the beat of a song and I'm like, okay, that's 130. Mm-hmm. And and it's kind of more natural, just why where somebody can listen and be like, oh, relative pitch. It's like relative tempo is just yes. it comes ingrained the more you use it. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, there's no shame like to have that consistency. It's nice as a drummer to kind of if especially if everybody has the metronome, you're like, it's kind of cool. It's just Great. freeing in a way. Yeah. Um but it's interesting because it's like there's obviously like some negative connotation, even with amongst drummers. But it's like, wait a second, that's who we are. Like baseline drummers need to keep the rhythm. Yeah. That should be like never second guessed. Oh yeah. Play to a click. You, know? you should at <laughs> least I think there's a place to play music where there is no click. Yep. Obviously. But you should never not be able to play to a click. That's right. just literally. Yeah, good, that's well just that's, you, that's an embarrassment. Yeah, you, yeah. Like, you have learn, to, stay, learn to do like it. that's that just shows that you can't do the job you're supposed to do. Right. That's one. Like you that's wouldn't, one yeah. major <laughs> facet of being a drummer is you're going to keep time. It's yeah. like the guitar player has to play in tune. Like right. That's just how it is. And and everybody everybody needs to be able to play to a click. Not just drummers. Yeah. But right. if you're a drummer and you can't play to a click. Start. Start. <laughs> yeah. Like Rob said, yeah, practice. Hey. Like, yeah. Just get in and practice. Oh, my God. There are apps for that. They're, man, <laughs> they're endless. So, most of them are free. Mm-hmm. Just do it. Learn. <laughs> Surprisingly, there's some out there, though, that have variants. Like, they speed up and slow down within a few measures. And you're like, what? How does an app that is a metronome do that? That uh, must be AI. <laughs> I'm like, yes. what? If this is bad. <laughs> Dude, now I'm getting into, like building tracks and logic that have push and pull in, mm-hmm. in it and like and really trying to hone in on that it's getting weird the te- the tempo <laughs> things going to another level boys yeah. let's go <laughs> yeah yeah you're taking it there yep. yep that like brings up memories of being in jazz band though and having the teacher going Not and, my it, tempo. you know oh exactly like the movie, the movie man yeah, yeah. but it's true <laughs> it's if you real. did play in a band and you, especially jazz band Prep has to be like, it's got to stay the same. I'm like, bro, listen to Miles Davis. By the end of a track, it ain't the same. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't care. You can listen to the greatest of the greats. Yep. By the end, it's burning. Like, yep. and, and, and it was just a feel thing. And who cares? Like, right. as long as you're not uncontrollably from, like, 130 to 180. Yeah, it shouldn't like, be, like, noticeable. Yeah. But that's I, arguably what made those jazz musicians so great, right? Like, their feel and, like, the emotion. Yeah. And having that those fluctuations, you know? Yeah, dude, are you into Weather Report at all? Oh, yeah. Dude, uh, that... I listen to anything under the sun if I could. <laughs> yeah, buddy, okay. So, like, have you listened to that live at 8.30, I think it's called? Uh, Jocko's on bass, and they play uh, Badia Boogie Woogie Waltz Medley, and it's I'm, like... I'm going it, to listen to it tonight now, so... <laughs> dude, it's, it like, it starts, it's, it's pretty quick to start, but, like, by the end, it's just cooking. cooking. See, that it's just like as long as it's a conscious decision, too, to me, it's all about intention. You know, yep. if you're making the conscious decision and you're not just letting it burn by the end. Right. And you're like, hey, it is what it is. If we get there, cool. Then it's like a different world. You know, especially a lot of the students I work with, it's all about the decisiveness. You have to be intentional about what you're doing. Yeah. It's just like when you're approaching fills and you're approaching, have that intention. There's a part of improv that's still very intentional, you know, it's, and it, it's the same with keeping tempo or, or flowing or on the beat, behind the beat, mm-hmm. ahead of the beat. It's a decision that you have to make. Yes. So. Yeah. yeah don't be accidental in yeah. those things, I guess. You know, there's – in my hometown, there was a lot of like – and I think this, pro- this is probably true in most people's hometowns. There's so many jam bands. Let's just get together and just jam. Yeah. Let's Let's just have – there's the blues jam, the jazz jam. Like, everybody has those. And you would see that happen and see it happen, like, really accidentally. And then sometimes you you go in and it's, like, really great players and you watch it happen and you go, that was masterful. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah. And there's – I almost can't even quantify what that difference is exactly. But you can feel the difference. But I I think maybe it's just – intentionality yeah i I would say that's a part of it yeah Yeah. like uh there's interviews with miles and you know if you read anything that he's like written or put together there's licks that he says i've used that lick for years and then this is just a variation of that lick it's in a new key or i've now put it 
in, you know, like I've used this lick that's in four and now in over five and now feels completely different. Right. It's like you're using patterns. It's all groups and patterns. And the jam bands in a way didn't go home and practice and they have their patterns down. Right. So what it doesn't happen with that intention, it feels a little bit more loose. But those bands that are well practiced are musicians that have sat in a room and played every permutation known to man. And then they come and bring that there and now they know how to utilize it appropriately. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and it's interesting because improv is definitely comes from like good practice. It's a muscle in the brain. Yep. Yeah. And it's like you don't use it. I haven't played in a band where we had full improvisation in a while other than the drum solos that come up. And, the, and in those moments, I play in such a showy band that if, if the Foxies were like drum solo, it'd be very articulated. It wouldn't be in the moment. It would be very planned out because it's more to me about the show right, where yeah. the bands where it's like, here's a, a drum solo. But they're planning out. It's like, oh, I have the groupings and, and you kind of just flow through it. Those are patterns they've played before. Yeah. It's just happening then. Right. Mm. But they still have played them. Their hands have played them. Right. They're right. not stepping out of the box. And, and what's interesting mm. is you ever do drum sheds at all? Oh, you, all the time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, when I, I have the opportunity now. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, and I hadn't in a while, but I just started having some more regularly, which has been great. Oh, dude. Um, I need to get You in grow. On that. Yeah, you do. Immensely. You grow immensely yeah. by failing, too. And, and yes. Well, and that's the thing. Sh- shout out to Jake Robinson and 615 Sheds. Um, you're awesome, buddy. Uh, but I realized in this, and jumping into this again, because I haven't in years really had like a a uh, consistent shed habit or really anybody to shed with on the regular. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what's the hallmark of what makes it so good for you to do is that you exhaust your ideas. Yeah. And then you get, you're like, okay, well, this is my go-to thing. And then suddenly you realize, well, I've done that like five times now. Yeah. That's boring. That's boring. <laughs> and then the real improv happens. That, yeah, that, yeah. that is when the new ideas start coming out. Like, okay. Yeah. Well, how do I take this and move it? Right. Like, well, And maybe it's the same idea. Orchestrated flipped, slightly different. Yeah. Or maybe it's an all new thing. And, you're, and then you're also stealing ideas you're seeing. And, mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, how can I – I want to try that thing. Like, oh, that was a cool little crossover from floor tom to the, to the crash. crash. Yeah. Whatever. How do I yeah. – how do I use that? Okay. He ended with that phrase. Uh, okay, maybe I can start with something like that and then move it this other way. There's so much value to that, man. Yeah, it's been, it's been a minute. It's a part of my practice routine to throw on a loop track and kind of pinpoint whether I'll be okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on. It doesn't even have to be like a shed loop. It could literally be like a Justin Timberlake song. Yeah. And then I go okay. I'm gonna focus on the vocal melody and I'm gonna start playing my patterns to match the vocal melody well, just ripping over yeah. the top of it and accenting the vocal melody with moments and being intentional, there's that word again, mm-hmm. intentional about what I'm doing. So then that way when you're playing with someone and you're just having at it, you're like, oh, well, I can now accent the guitar part or the vocal part without losing two and four, important, right. w- without losing tempo, also important. And, and it's like it stems from having that moment of failing and being okay with failing in a room, whether it's with friends or by yourself. But what's awesome about being in that room, too, is that you have the pressure. Whether you feel it or not or you want to admit it or not, you do want to perform well. You do yes. want to do your best and sound good. And then somebody goes, man, you're freaking great. Yes. Like you wouldn't there's, be human no, if you didn't want to do that. There, yeah. There's yeah. no – there's almost no better feeling when you get through something like that and – the bass player turns to you and like, dude. Oh, the stink face, dude. In the middle of it, you're yeah. like, you're like, yeah. <laughs> that's the best. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> that's like, thank you. That's that like you suddenly are like, man, I got big dick energy all day. <laughs> this is the best. Yeah, I'm the best, bro. Yes. Mm-hmm. No, it it is kind of like that though. <laughs> yeah, but it helps you in those moments because I, I mean, you sit down and the environment between show and and practice room is very different. Yeah. Um, no matter what, I do have practice routines with my students where distracted practice. Because a lot of them don't have the ability to play in front of people. So we focus on distracted practice, whether it be like trying to have them engage in something else outside of it while talking while practicing. So looking at me and playing the patterns and talking to me, holding out questions. That's cool. Distracted practice yeah. is a big part of distracted practice. Uh, if you can Dude. do distracted practice, oh, then you could get into this 
playing of almost simulating that live distraction because, oh, my kick pedal's loose. Oh, my beater's falling off. My snares are, oh my gosh. And then, oh, my hi-hat's too open. Those things start to pull your brain, that distraction of what the goal is. And the goal mm -hmm. is musicality and the moment. Yeah. And, and like, that's where I came up with that. I, I don't even think I've ever seen people use that, but it just kind of came to me when I was practicing. I would throw on the TV and be very active of like really shedding through my, my rudiments and like really just focusing and, and looking back and recording it and be like, did I lose it? Did I stay in? Did I, how, like how well did I stay in? Yeah. And you're like, interesting, man. That's such a great idea. What yeah. a, what a cool thought because there's so much bandwidth that's mm -hmm. eaten up by talking. When, when, if you, I mean, 100%. even if talking I mean, is the number one, I get students to do it. And, in, and it's the easiest way to get somebody lost in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Like, Oh, Hey, look at that. You're off the click. Especially, Hey, if you're practicing to a gap click. Yeah. Oh man. man. Like, Oh yeah. Cause then you, then you're relying on yourself, keeping this cadencing in your talking while also playing to the, the, the tempo and trying to maintain that tempo. Have you read, uh, I think it's called The Music Lesson, by Victor Wooten? 100%. Okay. That yeah. book is like a Bible. Like it sits, <laughs> uh, it literally is in my nightstand. Love it. Love it. Love it. That, well, I that idea that. of like I his mentor. That. Oh yeah, dude. Uh, it's it's life changing. He talks about his his music teacher having like, like a minutes long gap click where it's like, yeah. he'll just be sitting there having a conversation then just reach up. <laughs> yeah. and just nail it like oh he, my he god does it, he does what? that in his master classes he'll set to three minutes and then in the middle of it he'll be like and it's almost that's on scary. every time that's and you're disgusting just like, yeah. i'm like this dude's got a clock he's, somewhere yeah. <laughs> look bro it's good yeah it's a wire somewhere yeah. the wootens beep, man beep, beep. good god <laughs> dude reggie is so like okay so in the world of music i i think Reggie Wooten is a monster and doesn't have the like the credibility that he should the notability I should say not credibility yeah yeah like he, he is a monster Reggie is ridiculous now this is this is not shade on Reggie this is it's the opposite he plays in a way that's like purposefully very inaccessible you know like I've seen multiple times seeing him live I'm like he makes decisions that make the nerdiest musicians in the room laugh because you would have to be so ridiculously good at music and know so much about it to make the decision to play the shit that he does. Like he'll do something and you watch everyone on the stage go. <laughs> <laughs> what? You guys have to send me some of these videos. I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen it. We, we just come. What we need to do is just go on Wednesday and watch him play at Rudy's. He plays every Wednesday. Oh, okay, cool. And he, dude, he's amazing. Monster. Yeah. Amazing. And he taught Vic. He taught Vic everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Freaking but, but so like in the music world, people always, it's Victor, Victor, Victor. And I'm like, right. there's no down on Victor either. No. He's a, he's a God. Yeah. It, it's just what happens there. There's a such freedom in their knowledge too. It's, they know so much, but there's just mental freedom. And that breaking of barriers is the biggest thing I work on with students is like, we have to take this mental barrier and it just delete it like somehow and start mm -hmm. young. Like with some of my youngest students, I'm like, we got to stop. We, we got to stop whatever this is, these pressures, this going on, like it's, it's a thing. And you know, what's crazy. This led me to a thought I had, and I held on to, and, I, and I'm trying to stay in the moment and listening, yeah. Yeah. not thinking about it. And it came back. Um, you know, growing up, I grew up, I'm, I got, I'm a white guy. It is what it is. Four on the floor, two and four on the snare at church, bro. Yep. Yeah. You lose that. You're probably gone. You're gone. <laughs> you go to a yeah. gospel church. There's a spirit of freedom and fluidity, and it's encouraged. Yes. We look at these gospel drummers, these gospel musicians. I can't just say drummers, but we're at a drummer podcast. But yeah. they have that level of just go for it. Yep. And and it's ingrained culturally in what they're doing. And and it's like now we're at this cool world where it's like now we – I want to just – I want that. Yes. I want that so desperately. And and that's been my the idea of like where I started going with the JT songs. And I was like, I need this freedom of just being able to flow. Yes. That state of flow. And you're like, where does that come from? You know? And, and it's uh Howard Artis talked about it when he was here. He was like, it's that thing and 
there's a pressure because there's five other drummers there all waiting for you to mess up. And the moment you mess up, you're off you're the off. kit yeah. and the next guy's on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, That's what yeah. So it's like, get ready to, you better rip and not make a mistake. Like go, <laughs> like flow, do the thing. And you're, you're under so much pressure at the same time. I'm like, oh my god, that. Well, that's that's why you have so many drummers from that scene who are so insane. Not just drum, like you said, bass players, guitar players, keys across the board. Yeah, incredible, just incredible musicianship. Like, I mean, that's why they rule the pop world. Like, yes, it's yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> I mean, JT or no, sorry, Justin Bieber's band, Sticks. Like, Dude. The, yeah. everyone in that band, they're monsters. Like, I people get on me. Because I play in rock bands, but I'm like, I listen to more live pop music than anything. Yeah. Like, every day. I have listened to the same Justin Bieber live concert <laughs> for almost two months. Like, at least once a week. Because wow. there's just so much to learn from those musicians. What, they which which concert is it? Yeah. Well, I'm there's, writing this down, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so there's the... Uh, it's from his Justice Tour. Uh, but it's a specific one where they had Jonah come out and, like, start doing like a whole preachy moment and you're like this is so weird at a, at a concert yeah but he does he has a pre he has a pastor come out and you're right. like i guess this is cool like take yeah. your you know take your platform and use it like you are not being harmful so do it yeah um but yeah i think it's just justice tour and i i can't remember but there's in the main picture there's just two big crosses in it and it, it's just mind-blowing like everything every moment the talking, the speaking, every... That's why when I'm working with these artists, I'm like, we need to stop this singer-songwriter song. This is the song. Song. This mm -hmm. is the song. Song. Because it yeah. bleeds into musical moments on stage. And I'm like, I get the idea of interacting, and, and there's moments for that. There's times for that. But there's still musical moments that could implement that. We can implement the speaking with the musical moments and stop this like emptiness and awkward banter yeah and, and like and the one th two three dude, four i saw gwen stefani <laughs> recent yeah exactly that too like yeah. i've there's so many tricks i've got to avoid that as well that yeah. i could share with either of you or anyone yeah. but um <laughs> i i just played out in california last week we opened for gwen stefani and um awesome yeah and oh my god I was, I, I'm not joking. I'm an emotional person. I was crying. She is a goddess. And the band was unreal. Unreal. So amazing. The engineer, dude, I was like in tears just thinking about what the front of house guy was doing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. This dude, the electronic drum triggers and the electronic drum samples on the, on the tracks, it was almost seamless. He'd start a drum fill on the high tom. Drums were booming loud. By the end, it was track drums, and the and the acoustic drums were faded out in perfect time. Whoa. So you didn't lose them. It was like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and you were like, yeah. whoa. <laughs> the acoustic drums were just gone. He was just whoa. actively pulling the faders down. You're like, wow. this is a show. Every detail. That's, yeah. This that is, is a show. That is artistry yeah. from the audio engineer. Wow. Yeah. And I'm just saying, that is the difference. That is the tier. Yeah. That is what. That is the, like, and, and me as, like, as a drummer, I think, you know, how do we as drummers also approach that bench? You know, like, I'm not going to be a front house guy. I don't care. I will probably interact. That's my my personality, yeah. being a music director and, and being able to coach the engineers and things that I want. And I do that with the Foxies. We have moments where I want flooded reverb for her vocals just to go crazy and hard panning. And then I want it hard cuts. And, and I'll talk to the engineers and get them involved in that. But it's just like this: the level of shows. We're at this point where we have more control than we ever have at every tier. Yeah. yeah. So why aren't we doing that in utilizing that? So yeah, dude, okay. I I love that. Yeah. If you're not <laughs> if you're not utilizing that, you're simply leaving so much artistry on the table. Yeah. You the, could take a, a plain show with plain songs, and just enhance them to the next tier. You know, like. It could be the simplest track ever. You could be playing two and four the whole song, and how do we get it to that next level as musicians without overdoing it or overdoing it? Who cares if that's the moment? You know, it's like how do we take everything we're doing to that next tier? And it, and it's like that's why when people look at what I set up, you know, when I do play Broadway or gigs like that, they're like, man, you bring all that stuff? And I was like, here, always, just right here. Like yeah. I, I – 
bring mm. my TM6 electronic rig because we play so many pop songs where playing the snare drums too much, playing the rim is not the right sound. Yeah. Playing that stack is good, but not it. So I bring my one pad to get a clap and a Dude. snap. It's like, see, that's, that's I serving want the music. It. That's, yep. yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm here to play, not here to just collect. I love what I do. I'd rather spend my whole 30 or 15 minutes, realistically, when the other drummer gets off, <laughs> to set up the whole set and to be mildly stressed. Yeah. To get it set up to do the things I want. To be able to have the musical voicings I want on the kit. It's like, why not? This is something that I've talked about a lot with my mentor, Seth Carlson. And he was, he was like, I would rather build a show that's going to be awesome and have too many people on the show. I would rather have the personnel that I want with the gear that I want and have us not really get paid than to build a show that's like, well, yeah, well, at least now we can make some money doing this. It's like, I want to build a show that I can be proud of. Yeah. That's what I want. I'm like, once you've done that, that will make money eventually. It, like, if it's really good, people will want to see it. People will want to hear it. That's it. Yeah. You, like, you can't, you, it doesn't work the other way around. Yeah. People are like, oh, yeah, it was, that was okay. You guys were like, you were, were good, but kind of the sound wasn't awesome. It was like, eh, no, I'm like, no, you, if you came in, like, Snarky Puppy is the example. They I, played their my first whole show. Home. My whole way home yesterday, <laughs> Snarky Puppy. Yeah. yeah. Like, live Snarky Puppy. I just was, like, sitting there in my bunk just doing this. I was just like, next. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. But sorry. Yeah. But, I mean, play the, they played their first show. This is what I've heard. And maybe somebody can correct me if this is not correct, but it's what I've always heard. They played their first show in the basement of a pizza parlor. And... They, I mean, they had their whole huge crew there. People mm-hmm. were like, who in the hell are you guys? They came <laughs> in tight. They yeah. came in. They came in as snarky freaking puppy. Like, yeah. were they just came in and destroyed it? Imagine seeing that and having them be like, "This is our first show. Disgusting. You got way too. Many, there's no way you're gonna make money on that. Like, yeah, they're yeah. Go, they're for sure going backwards. But it's like, but we're making a statement, mm-hmm. and now. Mm-hmm. They're everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, exactly. A bunch of Grammys. They're like, well, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no, because, no. because you built something amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Dude, I, I'm loving it. This is super inspiring to hear. I mean, for younger drummers, because you mentioned that you seem to think that maybe, like, why don't more drummers kind of think that way? You know, wh- what do you think we need to do to, is it education? Is it just a mindset of, like, taking it away from just playing the drums and having a good show versus thinking about the entire show and the musicians and the audience and you know everything i don't you know <laughs> i it's a hard question because like not everyone is going to want that like you're going to have your players that just want to do their thing yeah but i mean just encouragement to like really take it back like let's i mean if you were to ask us and everyone else that you know as musicians the pivotal moment where music was speaking to you not the drums not the instrument of choice music music like i remember before i even had drums sitting downstairs pretending i was in the backstreet boys with my best friend we'd be sitting down there singing and just and having a blast and it was so i would say spiritual so awakening there was a Mm. moment where you're just like wow this is and and i didn't want to do that that at that age it wasn't this is what i want to do i just i loved it there, music is something that binds everyone in this world. Whether we like country, rap, hip, it, there's something so moving about music. Mm-hmm. And then when you pick up an instrument, it becomes so focused. It's the drums. So you become, I'm a drummer. Right. I got to play crazy fills. I got to <laughs> impress. I got to do fast things. And, and it's the same thing. Like you have these young students. They get that pressure of, I have to play fast because yeah, it's impressive. Rudiments, who are your favorite drummers? Not musicians, but yeah. it's always drummers. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, know, and it's just like. We take it too far sometimes. Exactly. It's, it, and I think it's kind of ingrained culturally as well. But yeah. there's something. It's kind of a, an encouragement of like, let's go back to where we started. Yeah. Falling in love with the music. I don't care if you like country. There's something in that. Mm-hmm. And and I know I had an easier time because my dad, when I was younger, when I got my drum set, said he would turn the radio on and I'd have headphones and he would be like, play this song. Then he would switch to another channel, play this song. switch to the, And just switch to the music. And I was like, I don't know it, but I was forced to learn it. Shout and, out and to freaking dads doing that. Yeah, yep. right? Yep. It was yeah, it was just, your dad, a similar kind of yep. situation. Like, That's, learn it. Yeah. There's something to be like, 
learn from your learnt. Learn. <laughs> Get learnt. Yeah. My brain wanted to say learnt as just a fun, just like, it needs to be learnt. You've got to be learning. Hey, drummers, do you need a place in Nashville to practice on actual drums? Drumbox is Nashville's newest drum practice studio. Book sessions online and get the space to yourself. It's fully equipped with two kits, cymbals, hardware, and even sticks are provided. 30-minute, one-hour, and two-hour sessions are available at www.drumbox.space. And use the coupon code NDP25 for 25% off your first session. Again, that's www.drumbox.space. And now I'm trying to be like, maybe I should just like put it up during shows and use live content. And that's kind of it. And I was like, you know what? I just kind of want to post pictures of what I do and say, fuck it. I'm already doing it. Yeah. Like, so like, I don't, I don't care how many people follow me on there. I'm like, I'm already professionally doing this, have been. So I'm like, well, I don't need the social numbers. Right. That's personally. True. I'm just like, eh. and it works for me because I can't balance it. Mm. I, I was diagnosed with OCD like three years ago. Mm. And, and like. And I've always kind of known because I get very anxious and, and very irritable, but I've never realized until being in the Foxies how that can impact other people. Mm. And it can be toxic at times because you want to control every situation. Right. So um, and that I, once I kind of got that notion, I never really like went through with the rest of the doctor visits of trying to figure out the nuances of it. Yeah. Like- My doctor pretty much said, have you ever considered – smoking drugs and I said um I don't really do that very well because it makes me more controlling yeah. and he's that like just, okay well don't do that it just cranks my anxiety up but thanks for the suggestion Doc. yeah yeah I was like I thought we were in Tennessee you this, this is not condoning drugs. that <laughs> no, it's exactly how he said it uh, and uh yeah it's a, it was a good question it's encouraging young students to like really dive back into the roots of music and loving music as a whole. If you stop thinking about what you're currently doing and think about the big picture, it also helps you with form. It helps you with tempo. It helps you with everything. Cause you're, you know, as drummers, we have four brains, but really there's that fifth brain where you're above it all, seeing yes. it all come together where yeah. you could see the bigger picture. So you, you learn something with your right brain and your left brain, and then you forget it by getting out here. Yeah. So it becomes where you can now play this pattern fluidly because you're not in your right brain. You're, again, up here. So those patterns become together. It, you know, when you're watching a student or someone learn something for the first time, they're, 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 they get it, and then it wobbles out because they're starting to look at one side, and then the other side starts to falter, and then you're like, you got to get back out here mm. where you can see it as yep. the big picture. You know, it's a simple three over two polyrhythm, you know, like – it it's way easier than you think, but for a young student right off the bat, they're just like, yeah. oh yeah, how do I do this? Right. And you're like, you got to step outside the box and hear the big form of it. You know, it's like counting. I heard uh, the podcast well, with Virgil where he was saying the importance of counting. Hmm. The conceptualization, even there, like counting becomes so in the moment and then you need to learn to, again, step out of it to feel large form. Right. Um, and then that comes to the music side. When you're playing the drums, you're playing the pattern, but how does that fit with the large form of right. the band, the orchestration of the band? Is this, I don't need to be playing Phil Collins in the air, Phil's in every song. Right. You know, it, it just doesn't fit. So then you take that and you encourage them to think of music rather than their instrument, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and again, it's all about encouragement. Yeah. Because I think there's a lot of mental pressure in everyone, so you don't want to be like, you have to think about this, you know, so. That's very well said. Are you a baseball fan? Uh, I mean, I love sports. Yeah. I appreciate I just, sports. I was just thinking of, like, the catcher, right? Like, the catcher and the drummer, they're behind the plate. Like, they have to be very good at that specific position, as drummers have to be good at on the drums. Like, you're saying to take a step back. Yeah. Like, the catcher has the unique position to see every the position, field. the yeah. whole field, literally. Yeah. Even the audience, right? Having that's, that balance. I've never is, even yeah, thought of healthy. that, but that's awesome. Yeah. We are the catchers behind the drums. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, but people always ask MD about sports. Role, you know? And I'm like, I don't particularly watch sports, but I value because they're in the same position we are. They're practicing. They're yes. working on their craft. It's people that work and 
dig into their crafts that I love. And, you know, like when you say stuff like that, I'm like, it gives you a deeper appreciation for what they're doing. So yeah. you're in a similar boat. Like you're not a huge sports fan, but like, and sports comes up a lot on this podcast because we pull away those traits of yeah, what makes 100%. people successful. The Kobe Bryant's of the world. Yep. Not because they can put a basketball in the net, but right. It's all about the effort and their routines and, and mentalities. The way they think about it. And I'm actually, um, one thing that I'm pulling from right now, inspiration wise, is I'm actually watching an anime called Blue, uh, Blue Lock. I love anime, huh. by the way. Have you checked out Blue Lock? I have not. It's, it's awesome. It's all about soccer. The whole premise for anyone that wants to get into it is these, a bunch of soccer players in Japan get invited to this thing called Blue Lock and they are going to turn someone in there into the world's best striker. So like uh, Cristiano Ronaldo or a, a Messi or someone like someone like that. We're going to build the best striker. And everyone other than that person will going forward be disallowed for to play soccer for Japan ever. So they're like, and you can leave or you can start the program. And it's all about each of them is obsessed with the craft and it's they they portray it obviously it's an anime it's you know it's going to be it's going to be crazy but they're the way that they take these characters through thinking about the craft of playing soccer what that what that entails like well every detail of it it's so inspiring and i like i i watch it as i'm like practicing I'm like, yeah distract this is, yes mm. <laughs> like it's a great it's a great idea. It's a really, really cool thing. And anybody who's doing that, the, rea- the reality is there are people, there are the, the Kobe Bryants, the Steph Currys of the world who are doing that. And going, well, how do I, how do I make this better? I'm already, I mean, and they did this to begin with. Like they're, they, how do I make this better until they're world class? And even once they're world class, they're still going, how do I make it better? Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. What's, what fat can I trim from this? And that's, you get monsters. So Steph, I've said it. I'm like he's probably the he's not the greatest player of all time, but he's almost certainly the greatest shooter of all time. Yeah, in, oh, yeah. In basketball, like unmatched. Yeah. So well, it's a, I think it's a tough balance because like you know we're taught to be the best individually, you know, on on our instrument and then in sports too. So you do have to spend that time alone. But then, yeah, you have to think of the bigger picture, right? The team, the teammates, or the other band members in this case. Yeah. So how do you balance that? Like being the best drummer, but then, you know, taking a step back, as you've said a few times already, just like, okay, well, what is my role? I'm doing all these things and I'm doing practicing rudiments. I'm setting up the tracks, but like, it's all for this greater purpose than just the drums. It's, you know, the band, the show, the tour. I think that's, again, like it's all about, it's it's the balance too. Like I I found myself in the world where we were just discussing like the whole VF 15 era where content, 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 uh, TikTok, TikTok, all this stuff (laughs) where we feel these pressures. And, and I took a long break from that. I still haven't even come back to making content, but I, I wanted to be on the modern drummer. You know, I, you know, I wanted to be on like, Anything that was notable for a drummer that I wanted to be known in the, you know, the top tier drummers. So you wanted to be on this podcast is what you're saying. Yeah, 100 percent. (laughs) Like it was my life goal. Back then. So not that I wouldn't want to be now. And I'm not saying, you know, I still have those moments where I was like, I want I want to be better. I need to be better. Um, But now it's like I want to make music. And and like I'm not going to say I'm a songwriter's drummer because I have a lot of technical skill that at times comes out and then is dormant for times. It's just a balance. You know, you have to be good at what you are and your craft and your instrument. So knowing it up and down, but a great example of why knowledge isn't always super important. You know, you watch some of these drummers that we'd already talked about. Um, Eric Moore is a freaking monster. (laughs) That dude's hands are ungodly. We talked about this at coffee, but the man has like his, his knowledge isn't perfect. Right. You know, he'll talk about, well, that was a triplet. And I'm like, uh, it was 16th notes in triplet groupings, but it was still 16th notes. And I was yeah. like, you were playing groupings of four, but, you know, your phrasing had three. So yeah. that's where we're going. So it wasn't a triplet. Right. You're still playing the 16th so note grouping there. Well, uh, s- same yeah. thing. Thomas Pridgen on on his Drumeo thing was yeah. like, this is a, uh, you know, you're playing five over four. And I was like, you're playing a five stroke roll, which is. Six notes. Six notes. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like that because there's a one yeah. note rest. That's not five over four. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, 
But you're still God. Yeah, you're, you're still, still amazing. Still, you're still you, Thomas thanks, Still would smoke me in, <laughs> yeah. in a drum shed. Yeah, oh, yeah. Both are like, it, but it's it's just to show that like you can sit in a room, read a book, and then the knowledge is sometimes useless. And, and yeah. it's like you said it earlier. It, there's no right or wrong path. There's you know I, that wasn't how you phrased it, but essentially. One person's path isn't the other. Maybe you said that. I'm, I'm not sure. No. But it was said earlier that, like, everyone's paths are kind of different. And that could even be, like, for me, my brain is just stay present. We've, yeah. You know, this is constant reoccurring sentences that we're saying. But stay present in your own life, in your own practice time. It's like, what do you need for this time? I need to be a better drummer. Yeah. I need to be a better musician. I need to be a better band leader. Um, yeah. Whatever your role is, own it. You know, the, that's what they did in their craft. That's why Curry is so amazing at shooting. He found out what he was good at, and he probably exploited the crap out of it. Yes. And it worked, but he was still a team player. The man brought so many wins to every team he's ever played for because he played as a team. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it, that's that balance. You yeah, know? beautifully said. Well, and, and the cool thing is that that applies to literally everything. <laughs> everything. It, you, yeah. Because your craft can be, you can be like, well, you know what, you know what my craft is, and we... I'm sure you agree on this and this to bring it full circle. My craft is a uh, husband. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, well, what do I need to do to be a better communicator? What do I need to do to become more patient? What do I need to practice in order to listen better? Mm. Like those are all treat those like a craft. Yeah. That, like, and suddenly you're leveling up in just life. Yeah. That's awesome. It's the best feeling. <laughs> I constantly get a little like, concerned when I meet people that don't have this innate desire to be better. Hmm. Like it, yes. I meet someone and I'm like, how did you get this far? Right. <laughs> like I, yeah, I, I work with a care? few. Yeah. I've yeah. worked with a few that are just like talented and then they live that talent. And yeah. you're like, Oh, part of me wishes you wouldn't succeed, but, <laughs> but, but I don't, I wouldn't say that, but I'm just saying, yeah. you're just like, how did you get here? Dude. Like how, I don't get it. When you work with them and you're trying to help them and, and develop them and then telling them to do this work and they look at you as if like you're you're on drugs and you're just like, no, 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 like work ethic goes way further than anything else. Yeah. I was like, put the effort in. Yeah. Dude, so there's a guy I used to train with back in California, one of my best friends, his name's James. He would tell you that, and he'd be correct in saying that he's one of the most talented people that you'll ever just encounter. Period. Yeah. He is. He just straight up. He's a he's a really brilliant dude and physically just a monster. Any athletic endeavor he would jump into, he would just dominate. Oh. Just freakish talent. So strong, like you when you would look at him, you would not think Oh, this guy would tear my arms off, but he 100% would. I remember we would go and like lift weights and we'd go, go to, we call it the flip gym, like go do the gymnastics thing and like practice flips and whatever. And there was a guy who came and trained with us who I would go as far to say he was probably the least talented in the group. But whenever he would go, I would watch him practicing the same backflip over and over. And I didn't see him for like a year and a half, two years. And I came, I came into the, the gym one day and I saw him one super jacked. He had gotten <laughs> insanely jacked, yeah. super tan. He looked awesome. And I was like, dude, you look great, man. How you been? He's like, Oh, you know, just doing, doing the thing. He kind of, he had like a Yogi bear voice. <laughs> His name was Aaron. Oh, you know, just, you're just, uh, just, just training. Just, I'm like, just, are you always in here? I'm like, I'm like you still go to the flip gym? He goes, "Yeah, man. Now I'm teaching the class over there." I'm like, "Wow." Now you're the teacher. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and then I was like, "Oh, well, like did you ever get the one arm pull up down cuz we had always talked about doing that?" He's like, "Yeah." <laughs> what? It's like cold face. He, yeah, yeah. He goes, "In fact, I would do it right now, but I just trained biceps." <laughs> and th and then he oh just and then he goes, "You know what? Actually." And he grabs, I think it was a 25. And proceeds to do a one arm pull up with a twenty five in his hand. I was like, "Yo, that, that's consistency, and that's why." Yeah. I'm like, I will never. Um, when I go down a path, I'm like, "That's the path I'm going down till I get where I'm going." 
The end, because yeah. that guy wow. exists. And he outdid my buddy James, whose physical talent is freakish and who is not – he would admit to you. He's like, I haven't really done anything with it. Like, yeah. But he could have he been in the Olympics. My best friend is that exact way. He's yeah. amazing. And, uh, yeah, and I tell him all the time, I'm like, you could do anything. He's finally starting to, like – I mean, it's been a few years. I think it, once he met his wife – it's always the woman, right? Yep. She just honed in on him, and now he's just killing it in life. And uh, it, it makes me happy because when you meet someone that is good, you just want them to have that same hunger. Um, you know, my dad's always had the eye for that because I've worked with some people, and he's like, no, they don't have that. They mm -hmm. don't have that Mike Tyson hunger mm -hmm. where you're just a monster, you know, <laughs> where you're going to go after it with everything you got. Yeah. And, and that that's – what we in the music industry need, like the industry needs people that are just diehard and ready to go for it. And it's at all tiers, at different types of tiers too. Like, cause you're going to get people that aren't and that are just talented, but like to constantly, I'm same, like postural, you know? Yep. Yeah. Uh, right. Instantly we all just go, it. yeah, probably <laughs> should. Um, but it's just like that, that hunger is just, we just need to keep invoking that in the younger students, the younger generation. Um, I'm I get to that point where now I'm all thinking about, everyone else. And I think maybe when I stepped into the music direction world where I love being able to meet with new artists and help them grow their show and like gave me a different perspective of what I want to do and comfortable in where I'm at. You know, that's a big key too, is just being comfortable where you're at. Mm. Um, you'll just drive yourself nuts if yeah. you want, 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 and you're like, why am I not there? And mm. they bring it back to social media, you know, it's another segue. Like that's, that's where it's so unhealthy. It's so yeah. just toxic because, I mean, there's something to be said, right? You're just like turning off social media and just like silently practicing and like becoming unrecognizable in, in a year, like to bring it back to your friend there at the gym. Like yeah. you didn't see him for a year, but then, but he was, he was plugging away. He didn't care about any distractions or maybe he did, but, but let he kept him, at it. Didn't you let know? him stop it. Yeah. 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 And then he yeah. just, and now look at him, you know, he's a yeah. teacher. <laughs> yep. That's such a cool story. Yeah. Imagine what you could be if you took one full year of just sitting in a room and, and taking all the different practice routines and gigging. Gigging is that definite importance, but yes. yeah, it's just a weird balance. I mean, they really, everything comes back to that word balance and because mm -hmm. like social media comes up a lot on this podcast and like, and I work in marketing and social media. And so like, I, I have a love hate relationship with it for sure, but definitely err on the side of the benefits of it. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. But it's like, you know, using social media while you're in the middle of your career trying to get the gigs versus like just getting the gigs and not worrying about then you then you have that platform. It's like what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's tough. Yeah, and there, I think it's really different no, for everybody. Exactly. Right? exactly. As we said earlier, like yeah. somebody could be a TikTok or Instagram sensation and you know, then they have to go and woodshed for a bit, you know, actually yeah. get better because they filmed one minute clips. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, th and there have been obviously <laughs> plenty of those. <laughs> there are there are in the music world many such social media sensations who are, and this is not throwing shade no. at anybody in particular, nothing. But there are for sure such people that they post their clip, edit the bejesus out of it, and it's like, well, this person couldn't actually even perform that live. Correct, Mike. Well, then. Well, you're kind of screwed. Like, I make, <laughs> what are we okay. doing here? Yeah. yeah, I'm like, well, now, like, maybe, maybe that's if that's you. Maybe now your practice is that, like, well, now, you probably get work on making it so that you can actually play it like that. That for that the would whole be great. song, right? <laughs> get that down. Exactly. Uh, unless maybe your whole thing is like, I just, I just want to make videos and uh, you know, make money off of. <laughs> off of YouTube ads or something. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. And you look at someone like Casey Cooper, who's literally made his entire career off that, and. And that's that's great. Like that's right. you know, yeah. And but he, but he has such a love for inspiring other drummers and like that community sense. So nothing against him. But no, right. not at all. Um, and even someone like um, Grayson Decruitman, right? Yeah. Like literally was discovered during COVID through his social media videos, and a lot of the and he's a Pearl guy, of course. And a lot of negative feedback at times is like, oh well, he doesn't have a gig. Like let's see this translate. And now he does. Now he does. <laughs> Suicidal tendencies. I think he's yeah, just... Yeah. He's Suck it, everyone who his, said that you know, guy wouldn't gig. Yeah, he's on he his, can like, play. his first he can tour play, now. Play. Yeah. yeah, so that's... Yeah. I think these days, there, it's more complex of what that answer looks like. Like, you really can kind of make it work for you. Yeah. It's not like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be... Well, well, 
I'm deleting all my social. Like my favorite post to see is like, "Hey everyone, I'm deleting my social media this for, for the month. next month." Yeah. But like, the, cool. They're on. They're do, they're making that announcement on Instagram. They're kind of like, they don't even do that. Just, yeah, just yeah, do just, it. Just Irish goodbye. Yeah. Don't say anything. Yeah. Just just. <laughs> it's like leave the account up for 24 hours to see who likes it. It's like, well, you're missing the point already. Like, yeah. Whatever. And those people that do that <laughs> are usually the people that are. Uh, th- that aren't posting consistently and really engaging with their people anyway. Yeah. I feel like in a way, like even if you did the Irish goodbye, the algorithm wouldn't <laughs> screw you be- right. because you're kind of there. <laughs> but the people that are, I think that may be needed for someone who like their posts are important. Like uh, we were talking about, um, what's his name? Woj- Wojtek, uh, oh, yeah, Derek. Yeah. 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 Derek, uh, yeah. yeah. Like if he were to just yeah. stop posting, You'd be like, wait, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where are the, yeah. Where's the lick there's, of the day, my guy? Yeah, there's yeah. an importance to what he's doing and, and, like, the consistency, the algorithm has got him. So there, there's that moment where, yeah, you should probably... I want to see him on a gig, though. Maybe he has one, but I haven't seen... Uh, Bro. Are we like, talk, we're talking about the same guy, right? Yeah, W-O-J. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a gig. Does he? Okay. Yeah, he plays with a pop artist from his country. Okay, cool. Oh, nice. And okay. I've seen live videos Corrected. of the whole thing, and Six. he's great. I'm sure yeah. he it, just it, smashes. He's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, that makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Because with socials, like, I constantly feel almost the pressure to get back on. It's not that I'm off. I just post so – I post just the things that I've done, like the tours that I've been on recently and um, what I'm about to do. And I'm like, oh, I should probably just get on a good schedule of posting at least photos, you know, just something. And just even just a document and not less – Less for them, but more for me in documenting where I'm at. Yeah, like a scrapbook. Yeah. And it yeah. feels healthy to yeah. me because it's it's not about capturing where it just got very unhealthy for me is why I jumped off. Yeah. I felt it was dictating my whole life and I didn't like it. I didn't like the way it felt, it felt icky. And I was like, yeah. I got to get rid of this. Yeah. yeah. And now it's like, cool, I don't need that for my personal experience. You know, I met enough people and, uh, you know, I'm. Moved to Nashville with the idea of su- like getting a gig and playing for an artist. I never dreamt of being in another band again. I actually came here with the <laughs> intention of never doing it. Yeah. And then I saw the singer of my band, and I was like, I need to be in that sure, band. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it is what it is. She's got the charisma. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I wouldn't be in it this long with the ups and downs that every band gets. Yeah. Granted, it's been a lot more ups than anything, so... That was my next question, actually. I was going to segue into the Foxy specifically. Yeah, yeah. Because, um, I mean, you guys have been through a lot. I saw you guys at uh, Live in the Green. Mm-hmm. That was my first show seeing you guys in the Basement East. Dang, yeah. Uh, you guys were opening for Billy Idol in Germany. Like, yeah, talk us through, like, how you joined the band. Were you the first drummer and kind of what, what's been going on since? <laughs> it's going to make me seem toxic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was not the first drummer. Yeah. Uh, I actually got approached to do a tour with the band because the drummer they had was not available. And I said, I don't want to do it unless I'm going to be your full-time drummer. I kind of forced the guy out of the gig. <laughs> I said, your drummer's not the dude. He He's not paying attention to the bigger picture. He's got a 311 crank snare drum. And your record is all 80s blown out fat snare drum. He's not even paying attention to the nuances of the snare drum, let yeah. alone the big picture of the show. Um, he was also building their tracks at the time and good guy, good drummer. Yeah. Not the guy for the gig. Right. Yeah. And, uh, he had other gigs, so it wasn't like I was like kicking him out. He was kind of just in this job. I wasn't yeah. just getting him fired. <laughs> so it, it was more along those lines. I, I just want the gig. You, you want a full-time drummer. I'm either your full-time guy or no, I don't want the tour. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. No, yeah, but sometimes in radio interviews when Julia <laughs> says it, sometimes yeah. it makes it just seem like I just got the guy canned, and I'm like, I'm yeah, put it on the record. It was pretty <laughs> like, dude. Well, you know what? <clears throat> my my mentor Seth Carlson. Shout shout out to Seth. Um, his wife Beth. When Beth uh, and Seth. Beth and I know, right? <laughs> I know. Um, their internet name at home, Wi Fi, is Speth. That's um, funny. Amazing. Um, so when they were young, they, they got married young, but they, they kind of had like the childhood crush thing and then, you know, s- s- dated other people. And then she was dating a dude and he literally went to the guy and said, that's cool that you're like, you're like dating Beth and all. Um, 
let me know when you're done so that I can I can <laughs> have a serious relationship with wow. her. Like wh- the balls, first Literally, of all, yeah. to do that. But like it's the same thing. You're like, hey, uh, I'm actually serious about that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so if 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 you don't have to take me, but yeah, it's there. if if you want me for this this one thing, I need the entire thing. That's that's totally fair. Yeah, yeah. I love that though because I mean the way you're describing it, like you were coming from a place of. You just cared so much about the gig. You saw like that professionalism that you know you like you were so confident in it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's and that that was probably a very um attractive quality that they saw in you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she at the time, she was signed to a deal with the McGee brothers who ruled the management industry. And I mean, Kiss, Darius Rucker, mm-hmm. Motley Crue, like their names went through the roof. So like uh yeah. They the, I it was such an interesting first time because after I did that, I like then I had to completely shift gears because now I was the new guy and I had to like earn my right because these guys have been around. I mean, it came to one gig where uh, the, our now day to day manager um, or sorry, our manager now was there our day to day at that office. And he came up to me after one gig and said, you know, that little 12, eight fill you did there. Never do that again. And I was like, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. It wasn't 12 8, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Actually, no, so it's false. It was, it, he said 3 4, and it was 12 8. So no, I was uh, just like, just classic non drummer yeah, 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 yeah. musician. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I actually, you know, jokes on him, I actually continue to play it, but not right. on the toms, on the hi hat. That's in hilarious. the same spot. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. You outsmarted him. Yeah. I, I just hit it. Slightly less loud. Yeah. yeah. He's like, it messed her up all the time. And I was like, it never messed her up, but I'll accept yeah. and hide yeah. it. Wow. I love it. You're like, but <laughs> in my musical opinion, it belongs. So I'll just alter it so that it's acceptable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, like, I didn't put it in the recording. I just yeah. did it live because it was like, it was fun. It just, yeah. Yeah. Fit. yeah. yeah. It just was musical. Yeah. 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 And I mean, 12 8 fits just fine over 4 4. It's, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so what year was it? Was this all happening that you joined? 2016 was about the time, so what? That was many moons ago now. Yeah. And what kind of shows were you guys doing at that point? Was it? I went. My first show with them was South by Southwest. So we, I mean, okay. we went straight into it. Yeah. We played, and then shortly after that was Sundance. So we played big festivals like right off the get. Um, we weren't on any major tours, but we were doing a lot of solo tours. But we played everything and anything we could get in Nashville. And um, at that time, there was not a lot of pop, let alone like punky kind of bands so like we stood out you know Mm -hmm. and her hair stood out (laughs) um so it was like easy for us to become one of the newer and bigger bands of that genre twist because nashville has shifted it's not solely country it's so much more now totally um yeah yeah, 100 i love it and uh yeah we have definitely been on big tours small tours even you know like right after the billy tour we did a little short run personally and it's crazy to go from you know 17 18,000 to the back to your roots where you're like okay we've never played in Idaho oh I mean we have but you know you go there and you're like hey there's like 100 people here yeah. <laughs> like oh yeah, yeah this is where we're at oh like, damn dude but <laughs> 100 people at your show freaking yeah let's well, go <laughs> that was a couple different examples but yeah yeah, yeah yeah um yeah I just played a gig with Jake actually at Whiskey Jam it was like I was thinking yeah, that yeah. the whole time like for him to to come, you know, off tour in Germany or wherever you guys were, and then to play Whiskey Jam, it's like, wait a second. Yeah, That's, I mean, it's like my boy Andrew, <laughs> which you guys know, Andrew Grasso. Yes, yeah, sure he, do. You know, yeah. like coming off this gig with Gail, which he is, he's a great drummer, and then he comes and still plays with all the local guys. I'm like, I love it. You know, his yeah. spirit, it, it, like an example of like, it is what it is. You love it. It shows that he loves what he does, and Jake, it doesn't matter. Jake Summer is the same thing. He'll, yeah. he'll play, come off of Luke and play on Broadway. Yeah, it's yeah. like it, it's so cool. it's not about the money either at that point. It's kind of just like I just love doing what I do. Yeah. And um yeah. that's to me why it's like where the Foxies are at such a point where I don't have the luxury of playing with other people as often. That's why I was like, what capacity can I still work with other people? You know, yeah. and and um but yeah, we're actually about to leave on May third June. We're in June, right? No, mm. no, June's coming up. June's so coming May thirty first, yep. we fly out to Frankfurt. And we're playing a bunch of festivals all over the EU. And then um, 
That's with a bunch of bands, and yeah. I'm excited to see Incubus. Oh my god! Oh man! Live from you. Side Stage. They're <laughs> my favorite band since yeah, a kid. So top five for me. Yeah. My, yeah. my first ever Modern Drummer magazine that was purchased for me by my mom, almost certainly by my mom, <laughs> uh, was Jose Pas- uh, Pasillas. Pasillas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, talk, you talk about that oh, in this dude. podcast. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, he's such a creative drummer. Like in technical skill, like he's good. He's great. Yes. He's got good hands. Not like insane, no, but, but he's, he's musical. Cool. Parts, yes. Like when you hear his parts in simple songs, like you're just like, whoa. And, and like, no offense to them on their newest record, but when I heard the newest record, uh, Eight, I I was like, doesn't feel like like Jose played on this record. Right. And like, but yeah, I'm, dude, I'm like mind blown. I love that band and I've seen them so many times, but I'm like, I will be. Side stage, hundred percent. I will uh, like yeah. eyes glued. Like every night on on Billy Idol, like we all at some point just were the first few nights in in the U.S. When we went to the U.S. half. We were just watching every time. Like mm-hmm. as soon as we could be, I was just like, "Is Billy Idol?" Yeah, like it's a freaking legend. And Steve Stevens, such an underrated guitar player, literal monster. Like he never got the credit he deserved. Mm-hmm. Like the dude played the theme song to Top Gun. <laughs> And and I'm like, what? He's a monster. He's a literal monster. Yeah. Play like, yeah, shreds. But um, yeah. And then the later half, we're doing a bunch of shows with Guns N' Roses, so that'll be Sick. interesting. Wow, and fun. That is wild. <laughs> yeah. I I can't wait to hear what that is like. That's gonna be. Yes. Yeah, it's gonna be crazy. It's yeah. If you ever want to do an Instagram live while you're watching Incubus, yeah, that right, be a good chance for us to see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe not for the whole thing. I was just at, I just yeah. watched Wage War, uh, which was awesome. Went with my buddy Clay Franz. Shout out to Clay, love you, buddy. Um, and there was a guy live streaming the whole concert. I'm like, oh. I want to beat the shit yeah, out of you. I'm please like, stop. Yeah, stop, stop that right now, <laughs> dude. Uh, Third Eye Blind. There's like a live show where he, in the middle of the, of uh, Semi Charmed, like stops. And the band's just kind of vamping on the low section. And he's like, call out this guy for he's like trying to like video. He was, I guess he was videoing most of the time. He's like, I know you want to get the moment. He's like, you want to capture the moment. But the only way to get the moment is to be present here with the rest of the people. (laughs) And he's like, I know, I know, I know you're upset. Because they literally (laughs) went to the ramping up to the last chorus. And the drummer just goes, stops. (laughs) Straight back down. And you're just like. They literally were about to hit the biggest part of the chorus, and they come straight back down, and everybody's just like, uh, "Goodbye, <laughs> bye." Hold on. Uh, <laughs> put your phones down. Oh yeah, I mean, he, oh, that man. that, and he does thrash bands that use tracks. So I was like, I'm gonna disregard that part. <laughs> yeah. He's like, we're not we're not a DJ rock band. We're we're a guitar <laughs> rock band, dude. And I was just like, I get it, I get it. But some people need to hire bands. And some bands can't afford that. So yeah, right. <laughs> you can. Exactly. Third Eye Blind. Yeah. Which I love. No hate. Yeah. Literally one of my favorite bands of all time. Yes. But I can't hire a keyboard player. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's true. Like, it's all about, like, being able to pay the musicians. Like, it is. What, if I could, I'd have everyone in the band and we'd play to a click and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I would. I would. I would love to take the drum sequencing out and everything else in there as much as I could. I, that's why I bought all the equipment I bought so I could stop putting drum samples in there and start mm. triggering them to put the performance back in my hands. Yes. You know? So, yeah. That's another rabbit hole. Yeah, we well. can't go now. <laughs> we, we probably <laughs> should or maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, at this point, I would say yeah. we're definitely going to have a next time because this there, – yeah, there, sure. yeah, there are conversations that just flow so easily that I'm like, oh, yeah, we got to do this again. Follow this up. is like for, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I, part two. So part fun, three. Yeah. Part 40. Like Rocky. Rocky. Yeah. Serving the Nashville, Brentwood, and Franklin areas, Music Lab Nashville offers comprehensive hands-on music lessons in contemporary techniques and styles. Students learn from the most qualified instructors in state-of-the-art practice and performance settings. All ages, all styles, all levels. Visit nashville.musiclab.co to learn more and to sign up for a free trial lesson. Well, I want to go back to something you said at the beginning of the podcast. Let's do it. We were talking about, you know, just touring at 19 and and all that and your first shows. You said, like, you're happiest on stage or something to that effect. Yeah. Take us into those emotions for you. What is it about the live show 
And do you do sessions as well? Like, are you are your studio guys? Too? Yeah, uh, when I'm in town, I have yeah. a setup at home. I do whenever it happens, it happens. Yeah. Uh, I for a while I was doing a lot more. I was doing a lot online, and then, um, but honestly, it just came down to the fact that I'm so li- I'm like in town so little. So like, I'm maybe every week in town for like three four days. So it's like maybe three at the most. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like, and I got other stuff I I'm doing. So in, unless the sessions like really, I wouldn't say here, I'm just like, I'm not like pr- actively pursuing it. Yeah. So when sense. somebody approaches it, I would say like once a month, I'm definitely tracking it at least two or three times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I focus most of my stuff on like building shows and like including gear like i i've been getting into doing custom cases and building full rigs for people so when i come to md and help it's the it's a package you know like you can get me to build your tracks rig your ears rig everything and like build it like i've been working with the artist adam sanders dylan carmichael country guys um and then some other pop artists that are amazing who aren't doing shows but um even in programming lights like it, it's a full thing yeah. that i do so is this all self-taught where did all this sort of come from and i know maybe from like for me like and a lot of drummers like it it's kind of like a ladder right like yeah you learn maybe this summer is able to next summer like yeah, you're doing, yeah it's not like everything has to be learned at once right it kind of came in like i i had a friend early when i moved here say hey i want to do a light show for my uh you know my first show in nashville and I was like, okay, um, what do you need? And he's like, well, I'm going to buy Ableton. Do you think you can learn it? And I was like, well, I've already used Ableton, so I, I know Ableton, but the light show thing, that's weird. So many hours of sitting on the internet and not finding diddly, and it was more just failing miserably on how to program lights on Ableton. Yeah. And then after that, I, I just got hired for more and more gigs to do lights, so that that kind of progressed. And then I just, they didn't realize it even mixed and I was doing like the track engineering side. So then that kind of just naturally happened there. Mm -hmm. So I was getting more light gigs and then now I'm, I'm, when I'm on the road, I'm on my laptop. If if anybody, you know, like ever gigs with me, I'm always working. Like I'm the guy in the back on a laptop transcribing uh, for students, transcribing for like artists, because I also write charts out for everyone in on bands that I'm MDing for, guitar charts, bass charts, the whole nine. Wow. Like I come, I you know, there's different tiers of which I will invest in it. Yeah. Um. So then that way, when they have musicians, they have the full show of what we have. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Um. But yeah, kind of just kind of naturally happened. I wasn't planning to become a light designer, and I <laughs> don't care to be, but it just naturally I just fell into it. Yeah, I love what you said about about failing too. I spent if you noticed Nate the the Roland back there. I've been I just like I know Ableton is is what I need to do next to kind of get me to this next level and so yeah, I've just been kind of locking myself in here and learning. You know, you have to start somewhere. So like for me, I was like, okay, I have Ableton. I have I'm I'm technically like aware enough of and I'm a quick learner. And I couldn't figure out how to just literally just trigger assign the play button to any one of the the rolling mm-hmm. pads i just i was looking up every video and like i knew well, like a tricky monster anyway. well i knew how to do it well i thought i knew how to do it and it just wasn't working i was like maybe it's just the roland you know i, I reset the firmware twice I, I mean i did every all this sort of troubleshooting and it was the simplest thing it was it was in ableton i don't know if you can probably understand it. it was one it was just i was essentially assigning it was on the keypad of the computer mm. to, to assign it not midi um, yeah. That's all I had to do. Command and it, K, and it command worked. M. Yeah, shortcuts. Yeah, I love yeah. shortcuts. But yeah, now it's like, okay, I just feel more confident and like, but I needed to go through that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I tell, I have one drummer that I work with all the time because he doesn't have the able to knowledge. And, and, um, I said to him, I'm like, man, just take the opportunity, take the opportunity to just get on Ableton and f- take, I give him the session that I made for his artist. I made him a copy and I said, Brian's bleep up copy and fuck up copy. And, uh, and I was like, just go mess it up, dude. Like go love that move things around. Like I need you to figure out how to rearrange it so that I'm not stressing out being on the road that you accidentally deleted something 
or you scooted it over by one measure and now everything shifted and the yeah. baseline and I'm going, <laughs> wasn't me. <laughs> that's going on the yeah. notes. So that's it's like, notes, baby. well, that's, that's great. That's a good point too. Cause like to bring it back to my example, I could have, let's say I texted you like, Hey, and you, maybe you would have said command K like, or you would have given me the, the straight mm -hmm. answer cheat code, which would have saved me a lot of time and would have been nice. But like the value that I got from, you know, maybe it was two hours here and me being able to see other parts of Ableton through failing, like I saw, you know, I was able to look at different settings and maybe I learned other things, you know, just through that process. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, it's like we said earlier, like the information, you could take a course on Ableton. I even for a while was teaching Ableton online and it's wild. It, I, I still have a few students that I do. And, and to be honest with you, it's not practical. It's just, it's just knowledge. It's not where you're going to actually use. I could sit there and tell you all the commands. I could give you a sheet of the commands uh, and, and unless you're using them every day, it's like, why did I teach you? Like, like, you know, yeah. like, what does it matter to you if you're not using that command all the time? Yeah. Um, so practical use. So just as what it is. Yeah. Someone on this podcast said like, oh, I forget who it was, but basically he was saying practicing can mean practicing Ableton or learning Ableton or yeah. learning the Roland or any, like, you know, just the software that you have. It doesn't as drummers, especially on this podcast, right? Like when we say practice, it doesn't just mean practice rudiments. Right. It means that everything about the show and the gig that you have. Yeah, you know? the, the that big picture, man. Like it's it's all about the big picture that you're focusing on the show as, as a whole. Like I'm gonna go home, um, and and do my PM work that I have for this big. You know, we're gonna be gone almost a month and a half, two months, and, and like figuring out everything, the gear. I have to program like all of our electronics are adjusted off of Ableton, and I control everything. Um, so like my drum triggers all change in live time, depending on where we are in the set. Um, and I program it all. <laughs> um, and then like it's, it hurts stems from that. What's that? No, it hurts my brain. Thing. I mean, that's stressful, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I have you, a redundancy yeah. rig that I built. Sure. So if one computer is yeah. down, it happens and I can always manually change the drum pads, but yeah, I have so many electronics and I just would hate to be playing a song and all of a sudden it's a... <laughs> And it changes to some buzz sound. I'm like, oh, yeah. and it's happened. I yeah. played and uh, someone yanked a cable and <laughs> it was no longer the sound for that song. And it was just obnoxiously, it was like a like a buzz saw sound on the snare drum. So every time I hit the <sighs> snare, you're just like, and it was high no pitch. Way. And you're like, <laughs> and it was loud. Yeah. Like wow. loud. Because I had like in the chorus of the last song, I had it the volume up. And it, it's a special effect for one hit. Right. Not and the then now song. you're hitting it on two and four and you're like, Jesus, oh. this is not the sound. You know, like, yeah. this is, like it was sounding cool there, not yeah, yeah. here. So, mm, context yeah. Context is important. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Could you fit, remedy that in, the, in that situation or? Uh, well, I mean, that's why I said redundancy rig was the most yeah. important, but <laughs> I just started manually operating the rolling unit. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I guess another segue there too. I mean, you're doing so much, you know, as we've talked about, not just drumming and you're having to deal with so many other people, musicians, mm -hmm. tour managers, you know, engineers. I guess just like personally, how do you stay, you know, centered and balanced and not overwhelmed? Like on everything? stage or like in life? Yeah, just in life. Yeah. I mean, yeah. on stage too, but just... I think I thrive in the chaos. Mm. My personality, my OCD that I discussed, I thrive in that space. So I, I put myself in those positions because when I'm not there is when I freak out. Mm. When I'm sitting still, I, you know, it's my RLS, the things that we drummers have on a, like a tenfold scale. Like I'm constantly shit. My br I can't even sit through a movie without going, what if I ever connect this game? <laughs> And, yeah. and it's it just like, it is what it is. And yeah. um, I feel the most at peace when I'm at working. And that is actually a trait that I'm breaking. I'm on the other side of that scale of hmm. now I need to be okay. Like I just spent a week away in Spain with my family and, and I was like going bonkers, dude. <laughs> I'm like emailing, doing anything I can to connect to the working world. Yeah. And I'm like, stop. This is <laughs> this is holiday. This is vacation. Like, yeah. Yeah. chill out. Enjoy it. Like, yeah. you and your sister are getting older. Like, it's, like enjoy the moment, the times. And um, 
it's interesting. But to answer that is exactly what it was. I thrive there. So when I'm on in the workings, it doesn't feel chaotic. It feels like I'm in control. Yeah. When I don't have my hands on it, it's where I'm like, is this going to work? <laughs> so people are like, can I help you put that away? I'm like, no, no, no. Because no. if I didn't see it go in there, <laughs> exactly. I'm going to be thinking, is it in there? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like yeah. a yep. clutch, like a hi-hat clutch, the yep. smallest little thing. Always. And you're like, if you have text that put stuff away, you're like, <laughs> I know that somebody's just going to buy a replacement, but I want that one. Yeah. And you're just like, uh, you have one instance where the one person just puts it in the wrong spot and you're just like, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. <laughs> you ever heard that Brian Regan joke about that? He was t- talking about like, well, you just get another one. He's like talking about a little, a little kid losing a balloon and, and screaming. He's like, yeah, you laugh at that. He's like, but imagine if it was your wallet. It just starts floating away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, relax. We'll get you another one. Yeah. I want that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. and and all the credit cards that are in it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, you know what I have to do to to replace that? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. the. I gotta the go same. to three banks. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. But uh, on stage, that's always fun. Um, the more preparation you have, the better you feel. So, um, I'm a very Active person on that stage. You've seen me play. I'm very engaged in the audience. I'm very engaged in the performance. Whether it's jumping, jumping off my drums, uh, or, or like throwing Some my stick sticks tricks, god yeah. high, yeah. like, or beating my cymbals upside down. I don't care. Like, yeah. it's about the show. Yeah. If I were to do this, Ableton, 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 yeah. and it, there's moments where it used to be more that, um, especially when we had our own light show that wasn't through this redundant system. Uh, where I'd be like, if the lights go off, we're in pitch black. Yeah. So yeah. now I'm sitting here thinking about the tracks, <laughs> yeah. the lights, and drumming, oh and 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 that was a lot, and it was a lot. Where at times I felt it distracted me from the performance, and performance was sacrificed. Yeah. But it came from preparation of redundancy, consistency, saying no to the light shows. When management's like, "Hey, we should do a light show," then I'm like, "No, let's stop doing it that method because it's just not." the way it should be, and as the drummer that's controlling it and the drums and this, I can't do what I'm here to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's where it, also where it feels nice to let your people take their roles and letting loose in that control where, you know, I'm getting to the point where I love the team, our audio team, and I'm like, take it. Yeah. yeah. Like, let me just do Go what forth. I want to do. Yeah. yeah. I just want to play the – and drums yes Dude, yeah so. i love that though i mean and that's come up tim buell his whole episode is about preparation and like preparing for when things go awry you know, yeah things go wrong you're prepared for those things you know if the lights go off you've, you've actually practiced that <laughs> yeah I, I built in a fail safe of just lights to turn on amazing i literally had a pad on back of my when i had the spdsx that would just turn lights on yeah. so they weren't moving because everything was programmed in ableton but i had it where it was just a sequence where it's like so if the main thing got unplugged, I could at least fire white lights or whatever just to have something on. Man. And I was like, cool, that works. Because there had to, it was a long time ago that we had a show and the lights just went off and there was nothing. And we're still playing, tracks are fine, and lights were just gone. And we're yeah. just pitch black. People are like, what's happening? I'm like, uh, <laughs> drums. Yeah, yeah. You're doing this. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Distracted practice. <laughs> Distracted practice. There it is, baby. Dude, I love that. That's gonna be in the title or or the keywords or something. Dude, yeah, that, that's that's that's, that's, that's so brilliant. Cool. Yeah. I literally don't notice when I'm doing it, but I'm constantly directing the band with my foot switch and the talk back while playing and just calling there out call outs yeah. while playing. And I'm just like, I'm kind of don't it's not where it derived from, but it's definitely like why I can do it yeah you know That's and so it's cool. not counting in time or in the metronome timing it's literally just talking about hey let's bring it down here yep. and then we'll play the A chord and hold it and then go into the next section and making like random calls while playing the drums um, and it definitely stems from church watching my amazing you know band leader playing the keys singing and then switch to switch and say something go back to singing the line and continue the sentence over here and you're just mm-hmm. like that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, probably even cueing the band, the choir. He would literally at times just be like, yeah. and then lean over and be talked back. And you're just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, 
Yeah. What's happening? I'm over here doing this. <laughs> the that that's the thing. The thing that's most tasking or taxing. Well, I was about to say that word is task switching mm-hmm. at speed. And that's the thing. Like you know, the the research is saying that nobody really multitasks, which I kind of, I kind of buck against. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, I, th- I think there is such a thing, but most of the time it is just fast task switching. Mm-hmm. That's hard to say fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's that is. Play in a line, direct the choir, sing a line, and then reach, reach over, talk back, Mike. All right, we're going to drop down right here. Like, what? How but are, again, that's that. It's, it's this. Yes. He doesn't exist in one this, realm. This, yeah. this guy, the guy doing all that's the avatar. He's up here. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. not He's not thinking about, he's flowing in that state. He The hand is still in time. Like, it, it's just, he's above it seeing the picture. If he were stuck on one of those tasks... It's where things start to fall awry. Yeah. Like you're you're just too hyper focused. Yeah. It, multitask. It could be that blend of where you're switching, right. but there's no like. It's not like the door's locked and you have to open the door to oh you know to get in. It's right. just an open passage that he gets to that other side. You know, it, it's that limb interdependence. You're not like you have to build that fluidity in it. And, yes. and it comes from that level of again seeing yourself playing it. You know, it's like. If you are too much on that one limb, it no longer becomes interdependence. It's, right. it's yeah. just limb, uh, like, skill. Right. Well, and and thinking too much about it, focusing on it, will mess you up. 100%. That's the, that's, and we've talked about this multiple times. The whole Andre Agassi thing, I've brought this up, like, probably um, way too many times. Yeah. But that, he, <laughs> There's a reason for it. Yeah. But, yeah, he was he was in his head focusing on his, his backhand. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, it's messed up. There's something wrong with it. And Tony Robbins came in and it's like, yeah, so when you were the champion, uh, were you thinking about this? No. He's like, okay, stop thinking, thinking about, about it. it. Yeah. And then immediately went back to just <laughs> dominating tennis. You're yeah. like, oh, well, well, there you go. No, well, go figure. You got Somehow you got in your head about this thing. I really need to focus on this. Wrong. You need to remain aware. Yeah. yeah. You're already, by all means, practice whatever you want. But just don't be in your head about that. In fact... Maybe it's possible you could be practicing. Maybe you could. You, maybe you can practice the wrong thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so too. Yeah, quality practice is better than quantity, as we all know. But yep. like, yeah. it, it's it's something in my brain of that, like allowing that freedom, it, and it comes in those moments. We said it when you're in the room, just like ripping with friends. The mistakes can happen here, but when you get up there, it's that point of just this is. All I know, mm. this is what I can control and what I can do. I'm not saying don't try things because that's not, you know, I would never say that. It's, but it's it's the point of just like get out of the way of yourself. Yeah. Get out of the way. Let's go. Like That reminds me of uh, one of my favorite quotes from Jojo Mayer. He's like, I don't want to think about my wings while I'm flying. Yeah. Wow. Same, the same thing, right? That's amazing, yeah. You know, Jojo. Dude, he like pff, drummer world. That man was on every page like, yeah, for so yeah. long. JoJo, man, that's a yeah. That's, the, the his breakbeat video, like in the I think it was Times Square, right? And he's on the street. Yes, I, I probably watched that like over a hundred times. He's just, he's just <laughs> and tried to learn it. I had, fully disgusted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Transcription, everything. We're totally getting off in the weeds about this. I don't mind at all, though. I, one of my favorite videos ever is just Benny Greb playing at Nam, mm. and then suddenly he just goes. It's Jojo Mayer. Jojo's Mayer is just standing there looking at him and like <laughs> Benny um, Greb being nervous that Jojo Mayer. Oh, that's wholesome. That's, <laughs> yeah, Benny's so cute. Benny is probably one of my favorites. Like of the modern era, he's just musical AF, dude. Dude, like, and oh, he is so freaking underrated. His yeah. feel, the way he thinks about time, and and how much his feel has improved. Because since since he's been a name in the drummer community, he's had he's had good feel, but it just keeps getting better. Better, yeah, yeah. It yeah. just keeps getting, and it's like well, his sense of just time and oh. feel, and and like yeah, when he's just taking these musical moments, when he takes a solo, it it's a it's a journey. Yeah, you're yes. There's yeah. showmanship too, but there's just it, it's a musical journey. Yeah. So. He's yeah, he's fully disgusting. Other favorite drummers, modern or the old greats? Uh, always the greats. <laughs> I mean, we everyone yeah. can list that. Um, Sticks, dude. Sticks 
Taylor's un- just, just an animal, like yeah, an is. animal. Um, Marcus Thomas. Uh, oh yeah. Freaking disgusting. Love that guy. Um, yeah, I mean, t- dude, I try to take something from anyone. You know, yeah. at some point, it's just like I will watch everything and anything. And if it's a live concert, I will be listening to it. You can ask anybody when, whether I'm driving, I'm listening to something live because I just love live music. I would rather listen to a live recording than the recorded versions. Mm. And I, I listen to any record that comes out. Somebody like the new Deftones, you know, came out a few years ago. Listen to it. You know, I haven't loved Deftones in a long time, but like I will listen to anything just to be like, okay, what production could be grown here? Like yeah. what's changed in the world? And, and uh, the new like Corn just put out a record at the top of this year, or it was last year. I don't, I'm not sure. And I was like, I, you know, loved Corn as a kid because they were the new metal band of the time. Yeah. You know, like. So I was like, let's give it a shot. So, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jed Smith said this. I'd follow the same practice. Like when he learns tunes, he doesn't just learn the records. He'll actually watch the YouTube videos, the yep. con- the live shows. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's where the creativity is. Like if you're playing on Broadway, like you're playing, like, yeah, a lot of times you want to play the record more or less, but you're still playing a live show. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you have to blend, you have, there has to be a balance there. Yeah. Dude, yeah. that's the fun part about pop tunes. Like, people mm. take pop tunes for what it is, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So when you watch a new drummer that is, like, new to pop, they play it, like, pretty square. It's, like, very square or, or like, over the top. But <laughs> but at the same time, you could tell, like, they've never really dug in on how to, like, make it dynamic yeah. and in the moment. You're like, this is a... There's a lot to be had here. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you you talked about JT. JT is a perfect example of that. His live show, like, dude, all those songs, they are totally the songs, just like on the record. You'd hear him and go, yeah, I love this song. Great. Sexy back? Totally. At the same time, it's a completely different arrangement. Yeah. It's, like, the vocal it's a, stops, like everything. You're just like, it, It's just like a sick gospel arrangement. I love that. I'm like, yep. Yes. It's sad for me when the, I don't see that. Most of the time you see that live with pop groups. Mm-hmm. And once in a while you come across something that's like, oh, that's identical to the record. Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> Why is it identical? Why didn't I just listen to the record? I should have just stayed on Spotify and, <laughs> and like taken a nap. I don't value those concerts as much. I see, like I saw Post Malone do a full show with just tracks and a crazy light show. Yeah. And I love Posty. He's great. Yeah, I love him. Yeah. And, um, I was still blown away. I would have loved to see a full band behind it. Yeah. yeah. Just to see what could have come. But like the production behind it, I was like, okay, I understand why. There was absolutely no way a band would ever be able to be afforded <laughs> with the production. Yeah. There's like lightning bolts like happening in the fog from this massive lighting system they had. I was like, yeah. that's pretty cool. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Whatever that Love is, it. that's great. And then you see like, obviously Tony Royster's a f- Mofo, yeah. that dude is legitimately just like an implanted alien inside of a human body. Like, whatever comes out of that man's hands, you're like, <laughs> yeah. He yeah. did that whole Katy Perry in Vegas. Like, if you haven't watched that concert, I haven't. It's like yet. a full production. It's like yeah. a musical. Yeah. yeah. Like they have a full production, but full band, and the way oh, they the played, nuts. I kissed a girl. Massive, dude. I will never play that song. Any other way than the way they did for that live show. He sticks to the freaking toms and makes those monsters sing as soon as the chorus hits. Oh, that's awesome. But you see all these drummers now that'll like take the chorus and they'll play it on an open hi-hat like a rock drummer would. And you're right. like, but wait, man. You could do something else. Yeah. I was <laughs> like, just Make play the toms, like just beef them up. Keep that verse low, same little groove. And then you get that, just make them sing like you're in a like just a jungle beat, just freaking huge toms. Like you add like extra layers as if there was another drummer playing the other high high rhythmic parts and you're like how can I layer this yeah mm. yeah it's fun it's fun it's the fun approach of listening to the live shows you're like yeah just more possibilities yeah I mean you have to entertain there's people there that paid money to see that you know yeah yeah I mean you listen to a straight ahead record and you're like cool that that is what it is right I can play that beat I can, I can yeah I can do that yeah and that's the interesting thing is when you do I've known this to happen? A few people have talked to me about this. I'm like, yeah, I went for, to an audition and I played it like the record, and they didn't like that. I'm like, oh, oh, interesting. <laughs> like, yeah, like 
yeah, well, live, it's like this. I'm like, oh, well, that's... <laughs> You would think that they would come. If they wanted, they would have sent reference tracks, right? Right. Come on, and maybe and maybe that's part of the thing. They're like, we want you to sometimes like, yeah, like do 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 the research exactly. Yeah, yeah. Take that initiative, like, well, and if you came in and you said something like, "Would you like me to play it like the record, or do you want me to play it like like your live arrangement that I saw at such and such?" Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. That's, see, that's baller coming into audition, like multiple choice. How would you like me to play this? Because I prepared both options. Yes. Oh, I, I like, did that at an awesome. audition. Yeah. And it was like just for, I didn't want the gig full time. I just, like, it was a newer artist. I went above and beyond. I went in and, and spliced all of the drum samples and made tr- like on my Roland and put triggers for, because it was a pop gig. Yeah. So, like it ended up being where the drummer that got the gig knew the guy from college, so I was like, I'm not upset about it. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I it was Jake and I both auditioned for the gig, and um, they were like, you guys just play so well together. So I was yeah. like, cool. But yeah, <laughs> friends, no friends. Um, I met awesome players. The guy that got me an MDing was from that audition. Like I never mm-hmm. even dreamt of picturing myself as a music director until I met Drew. And he he does like five seconds of summer, and like when I met him, my whole perspective of live pop shows has dramatically been changed. Mm, that's interesting. So I'm like, hmm. yeah. Well, should we do some closing we questions should. here? Yeah, yeah. Quick? I just I'm curious, just drummy uh, related, just like what your current setup is, any favorite mm-hmm. gear you're using. My favorite gear. Well, I just recently made the switch from Istanbul to Meinl. Um, hey, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. I I love both companies, uh, and I'm currently working out what package I'm going to get. My We're still kind of formulating all that. I mean, I, I've been shopping around and know what I like. Yeah. You know, every drummer has got that taste, but... I'm also just like, I want a few more extra things for my own library. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Minel Symbols, I've been dabbling in different drums, but as we talked before, I've definitely been more on the Pearl game because of the versatility with Kit. Um, I'd love to track on like a big fat Master Series 24 kick, you know, Mm -hmm. has that tubby like sound, but then playing live, I like just shallow toms and and, like, you know, just something easy set up the accessibility yes. I don't want to play on a massive rock drum kit where the toms have to be tilted and, and angled in ways I don't want them to be yeah I want my drums to be there in my face <laughs> the like, Tazir Pantera Superman, like yeah. dong yeah. drum yeah. on the side where your hands are yeah. doing this flat to vertical flip yep. you're like that is not ergonomically appropriate <laughs> in this yep. day and age like yep. they make fast toms for that yep. but yeah uh, anything specific I'm using my role in TM6 for TM6 Pro for the uh, drum triggering. Um, for certain artists, I'll trigger every drum, um, and I have internal mounted drum triggers by called by Joe Becky drum triggers. Mm. Um, uh, for fly dates, I will use like the Roland like Tom triggers and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, I, the TM6 I switched over to that because I just like the, the sense it's ergonomical to the kit. It's like the ergonomics behind it. It's easier to hit if I want my Tom pad to be by the toms not on a you know over here right like to the left where i have to now like go from uh playing down the toms to now reaching for a tom on a pad on the you know spdsx or then ungodly putting the spdsx where the ride goes and then moving my ride where drummer shifted to that and i'm like that's just a weird place because now yeah. when i want to play it as a snare drum i'm playing <laughs> open-handed and, and that's fine i, I can do that just fine <laughs> yeah. but it just kind of changes the way it so yeah. the TM6 for me opened up the kit. It allowed yeah. me to put the pads where they exist and where I want them to because it's just a trigger unit. It's just a brain. Okay, right. so it's individual drum pads. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. it has yeah, sure. up to 12 because each one could be uh, its own pad, so six inputs. But what's cool about the TM6, if no one's used it before, it has six outputs. So you could let you could put your kicks out one, two, and oh, give cool. the engineer out front stems. So all my drums can be stemmed out. So the front of house has the acoustic drums and then the electronic drums That's sick. Yep. out front of house in their own specific spots. So then that way, if the one tom's not too loud, you're not or like too loud that, that you're not sitting there. The nuances on the roll and you can EQ them exactly flat 
and then out front they can They'll adjust it, it yeah. appropriately to the venue, which right. is how it should be. It should be tuned to the venue, not tuned to the the moment. People mm-hmm. always want, oh, it's like this this doesn't sound good here. It's like well, it's not appropriate for everywhere. You know, like I could turn the kick drum down here, and then you go to the next place, and it's loud as crap. And then you got to turn down more, or uh, vice versa. So yeah, but. Yeah, I yeah I love me all those companies, uh, Vicford Sticks all day long. Yeah, nice. I, I've tried others. I don't know where you guys are on that one, but um, I'm, I'm mostly I'm, Vicford. Uh, Pearl was distributing this company, uh, Vincent Drumsticks, a hmm. Swedish brand, which oh, I you s- told me that at I coffee, still yeah. use. Yeah, they're still being sold, I believe, in the U.S. Um, but yeah, I'm a Minel stick and brush guy. Okay, yeah. I you know what? I don't think I've sat down with the, like a Minel stick. I'll. We'll, we'll make that happen for you. Yeah, yeah I, I think the only reason I stuck with, like, I, I love Vic as far as, like, tip versatility. I'm a very appropriate, like, like, playing some fast acid jazz, man. Like, I want a teardrop tiny 7A stick that's yeah. just burning in my hand. I don't want a beefy, fat mushroom tip. And, and, you know, like, I want something that feels like it's doing the job. Yeah. Yes. And I don't want to get in the way. And, and people, uh, like don't realize that there's sticks that are more appropriate for certain genre styles playing. Yeah. They're like, they're, it's built for that. Like you go to pick up a Peter Erskine stick, playing 300 plus is much easier than oh, having man. a 5A yeah. standard like teardrop mushroom tip. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. you're just like ticketing, 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 ticketing. Like that's why, like you see a lot of those guys doing the fast ride technique. I'm like, man, that's so crazy. I'm like, and they're using a maple stick. It's maple. Maple. That's why. <laughs> like, yeah, no kidding. Of course they can do it with, with that. I, Try doing that with a 2B. Get back to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Give me, like, three of your favorite food spots in Nashville. Food spots? Yeah. We gotta, mm. We're Nashville podcast. we got to talk Nashville a little bit. Yep. Nashville podcast. Well, um, I'm a bougie boy. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to House of Cards, but... I haven't. My wife's been there a couple times. I love me some House of Cards. Yeah. Um, it's like a higher end like restaurant, so like I would always get a steak or. But the, they have really good bass there as well. Um, but the fun part about the restaurant is that they do magic shows. Oh. So it's uh, speakeasy, um, and they have table magic. So when you're getting your cocktails, it's probably the most fun experience. You get sat. It's at a specific hour. So you get sat in a specific timeline so everything's spaced out perfectly. Hmm. So there's a person that comes over and does table magic after you take your drink order. They do the tricks, okay? And then by the time he's done with his show, your drinks are at the table. And then another magician comes over after your food order's been taken and he's doing the magic and by the time he's done, your food's on the table. And then when you're done with the whole thing, your uh, purchase is also a 30 minute live show in a theater where you get to see magic. Oh my god! I've never heard of this place. It's so fun. It's so fun. It's an experience, yeah. and the food is good. It's yeah. great. I mean, yeah. it's not my favorite like higher end restaurant, but it's it's good food. Yeah. Yeah. Cocktails are phenomenal. Wow. Um, that's yeah. always like my go to whenever I have friends, family. I'm like, we're going there. Okay. It's okay. Fun time. Love it. All right. That's. Um, as far as like everyday eats, there's this food truck on Nolansville. Uh, I'm sucker for just like truck tacos. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a coffee guy, Ooh, so I would say yeah. uh, I, I'm a big fan. If you've ever been to, I'm pretty sure they're making a move, but Falcon Coffee was always my like little vibe. Oh, um, in the notes, never been. Love um, coffee. They recently shut down the location they had, but you could keep an eye out. They were they were um, a nice vegan focused restaurant, or, or like their food was vegan, um, and it was right in Wedgwood, Houston area. Mm. They opened up that new like Airbnb kind of like hotel thing and they closed and I know that the owner was trying to keep it very low key they had very minimal seating and they were trying to be a big place and I talked to them a million times they wanted to be in a neighborhood that's like local so I think what they did is they're moving um, because they recently just closed the doors but um, yeah all right last question that I have Uh, just any other hobbies away from the drums that you have I would say big hobby would be gaming okay what are you playing right now (laughs) <laughs> I was like, where do you uh, I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna take, I'm just gonna take a guess. I'm playing the new Zelda. The new Zelda? Uh-huh. No, I'm. Uh, I put Breath of the Wild was the the newest because they, they have a new. They, yeah. The sequel to Breath of the Wild is okay. out. Yeah, so I have not, I've not cu- kept on on that series because I for some reason 
did not make it through most of Breath of the Wild. Yeah. And it wasn't because of the game. It was solely based off of uh, not being able to bring my Switch on the road. Oh, yeah. That was so, it. yeah, yeah. Uh, but I have a gaming laptop. Um, my buddy's really got me in Fortnite because of how competitive it is. Mm. And I think I, uh, strange enough, like, I looked at it first time. And I was like, this is a terrible, stupid game. And then I looked at the mechanics that it takes to build the things. And I was like, oh, I'm going to love this. Because you have to actually be technically good at something. And I'm like, it's like drumming. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you actually have to, like, get Building mechanics. Sessions, and yeah. I'm just like, Ooh. So I started <laughs> practicing that stuff when I was having fun. And somebody's like, you just sit there and, like, play Fortnite by yourself and practice those things. It's like, it's like drumming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm no, like, I'm, watch me in a I'm year. I'm going to kick the game. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but yeah. no, I'm old, so I, I still play Halo 2, like, religiously. Love it. Yes. Yeah. We would usually end by saying, where do you want people to follow you? But it sounds like you don't want people following oh, you. I mean, you could follow me. I'm becoming more progressively on there. And yeah. I... I'm always on there for the meme's sake, so send me good memes. Love it, love it, love it. But you can just contact me on any socials. My email, robbodleydrums at gmail. Any of that works. Sweet. Love it. Sweet, man. Well, thanks for the time. Yeah, yeah. No, this is a blast. Thanks for listening to this episode of the National Drummers Podcast. If you've enjoyed these podcasts, please consider supporting us on Patreon. For $5 a month, you can help support this dream and keep the ball rolling for us. Believe it or not, it's not free or even necessarily cheap for us to make this thing go. To sign up, go to patreon.com slash Nashville Drummers Podcast or click the link in our Instagram bio. All of your help is greatly appreciated. Check out our new website, nashvilledrummerspodcast.com. And if you're not already following us on Instagram, you can follow us at Nashville Drummers Podcast. This episode was recorded at Diamond Sound Studios located in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you, you for listening, listening and we'll see you in the, the next, next episode. episode.